I'll erase it for now and work out what you do in the example where you only have one discrete symmetry. The group has only two elements, identity and uh, reflection or rotation. And I'll work it out in detail. The good news about discrete symmetry is that once we work it out for a three-disc billiard, we know everything. Because the first non-abelian example, which is having three elements, is good enough to understand all finite groups. It has the one-dimensional example of this reflection is a little bit too simple, but it gets you started. Reflection symmetric, 1D map. Example of which is on the right hand side. This map here, or you know. Evolution operator. For one step in time. Is. Dirac delta function. If I apply operation to the final and initial point, that will be delta of r y minus f of x rx, which by symmetry is delta of matrix of operator r, which in this case is just plus or minus uh, either 1 or minus 1. So if you start computing Jacobian, Jacobian of reflection will be 1, absolute value. This is the same thing as, so equivariance acting on evolution operator just says that evolution operator doesn't change its form. If I rotate both initial and final point, if you look at a pizza, it's very obvious. If I take a different piece of pizza, I take a trajectory. I hopped from here to there. Or if I hop from GX to Y, I'll get the same result. Next thing that I can do is I observe that group operation square mean getting identity implies that if I take the right identity as one half identity plus flip plus one half acting on any function, any coordinate, that's obvious. But if I call this projection operators P plus and P minus, then I can write my evolution operator is a sum of evolution operator that acts only on the this part. We also have that p plus p minus is zero. P square of either one of them is you stay in south. So this is a projection operator. I can decompose L into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts where these parts are defined as a one half and now if I apply lambda p to lambda minus and I use the properties of projection operators you can check that I cannot propagate from evolution under, of symmetric 
parts. This picks out symmetric functions and the other one picks out anti-symmetric functions. And they will not mix. Our goal was to compute determinant of evolution operator. At the moment, I'm just looking at Perron Frobenius, but as we did for diffusion, I could put a weight here, etc. But for simplicity, I don't do it. And the crucial thing is that this is an anti symmetric function. That our goal is to compute the determinant of this evolution operator because its spectrum will tell us what the natural measure is and how the long time correlations behave, how things decay to natural measure. That will be controlled by the eigenvalues of this operator. Originally, we were computing this and the way we did it is first produce the trace formula for lambda and then we compute the spectral determinant using that, so we have very explicit expressions. And now I have to show that when this happens, this evolution operator, as far as group theory is concerned, becomes block diagonal and acts on symmetric and anti-symmetric functions separately, which means that there will be two determinants and they'll factor. Now, this discussion is, applies to any system with a single discrete symmetry. I'm just using one dimensional map because you can visualize the term. So what we found before is the way that this determinant is produced, computed in periodic orbit theory, is that we compute traces in neighborhoods of periodic orbits. So I can look at this calculation, because the way the trace formula was computed is we integrate over a whole space, but it only got contributions for any finite time in open neighborhoods of periodic orbits, provided that we have quotient its continuous symmetries out. And then the determinant is obtained by exponentiating the trace, basically. So I can look at determinant associated with the periodic orbit. Well, you know, it's a little bit hard to explain, but what we do in Floyd dynamics is second quantized form because we go from few degrees of freedom to infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, you know, it's not easy to explain because we don't think of second quantized form as local harmonic oscillators. But essentially, that's what it is, because when we compute Jacobian, we are computing the local derivative of a Gaussian or something. So it's, it's very close to that, but I don't use these words because people are already mystified with second quantization, and, you know, why confuse them further? <laughs> but I think that's, you know, going from ordinary differential equations to fluids is the same as going from uh, harmonic, you know, free body problem in quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, because the whole space is. So now, you know, now it's a real course. Everything was a warm up, but the <laughs> these few things I find are really, really require straining. Everybody said, including mine, I find it very hard to explain. I mean, is this, oh no, I made a wrong, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, when I looked at it, the second was on a five. <laughs> I said, oh God, I've been talking. No, no, okay. So let's try to work out the one dimension. So I'll take, I have the notes. They're not terribly, I mean, there, there is a reasonably good, but not all that good. So think of the periodic orbit that maybe looks like this, and any relative which is symmetric under a flip. So I'll, I'll work out one of these traces. Then uh, 
these guys, when you think about them, they always have to be of even length because you know every point has to map into every point. So I don't feel like drawing a longer one, but they will be always of even length. So call let's call that cycle S for symmetric. Then the period these are all integers because we are looking them up. Period of an S is always twice the period of the symmetry reduced thing, which is the half of the cycle. In this particular example, you know, it went to the fixed point, but in general, it'll be cycle just half half of the length because it's periodic orbit has a property that you go around half of the time and everything else is repeat of what you already did by reflection. So this is uh, in the symmetry reduced, what we call relative periodic order. And that means that if I go, if I take a point on this cycle, any point on it, and I go uh, half of the period, and yes, I'll end up at the reflection. So if you remember, <coughs> the relative periodic orbits are a property that you would go the period of relative periodic orbit, and you would come to the same sta state up to group operation. But here, group operation is very simply just a reflection. Yeah, in this case, the only one I bothered to draw, this guy is the same as this one up to reflection. So then, this map has a, you can see that what used to be a positive slope becomes a negative slope in the reduced domain because we obtained this by reflection. So this whole branch this whole branch that used to have po positive slope now has a negative slope. So it means Jacobian computed on it will be like the original one, but multiplied by the reflection. Or Jacobian of the thing computed. So this is stability. It's one dimensional map, so it has only one expanding eigenvalue. Is you go uh, ns points, you compute the derivative, and, uh, and you evaluate this at uh, x equals x zero. And in reduced space, we'll define the <coughs> Jacobian to be the group operation times the stability in a full state space computed up to that point. <coughs> so minus sign shows up. And later on, this will be called character. But it's one dimensional, so you don't realize that there is any ethical decision involved in this. So now, what does the trace look like? Uh, on either symmetric or anti-symmetric operator. We compute it on the fundamental domain. This Zn is just for convenience. And this is plus minus x. And the, you know, this is in the neighborhood. So this is a little tube of periodic orbit S. So we'll pick up only contributions from that. And uh, it'll have a property that <coughs> for even times, whenever we have a even repetition of prime cycle period, which means we have a repetition of the full period, we'll get
And for the odd ones, so we only, for even ones, we only pick up this guy because for even ones, we are completed period, so it doesn't contribute. But for the odd ones, we get a contribution from gone halfway around where uh, the little traces as usual in, in this case it's just uh, yeah that's why I put Zn here trace lambda n uh, little traces the length of the cycle divided for, by the stability of a prime cycle and now we do the same song and dance as before. Uh, I guess I can write this as the length of the prime cycle r goes to infinity delta n r prime cycle repeated. Um, and I can absorb this plus or minus you know, for the odd cycles, plus or minus is preserved if raised to the power. Now, that was the starting step in our computations of determinant. This is a trace formula. Then we summed it over all z to get a generating function. You do it here as well. The new element is that the weights are actually <coughs> computed on prime orbits and there's some plus and minus signs. This formula is correct for all the symmetric cycles, G symmetric cycles. So you get D1 minus Z lambda plus minus computed on any symmetric cycle. Is a product, just a product of K equals zero to infinity one minus plus t as computed on the prime cycle of a so the new element that came from the group theory is the sign here and uh, in general it'll be called character uh, but the nice thing is that now we are computing everything on fundamental domain this is done on a fundamental domain and this is stability of relative prime cycle and this actually cares about signs. There's no absolute value here. So all kinds of weird signs show up due to group theory. And you go through this. And eventually, the final answer for anything that has one discrete symmetry is that determinant of one minus <coughs> that you're interested in becomes a product of two determinants, one minus. And it'll turn out that this one is the important one, the most symmetric one they'll have to do with the ground state and natural measure. And this one will have to do with uh, amazing thing that if you start in the other subspace you never come into this one there there's independent subspaces and uh, each one of them has a formula determinant of one minus c l plus is a product and it treats asymmetric cycles differently contribution of symmetric if they're symmetric, only prime cycles will contribute. And then there is a third piece, which seems very trivial, is this boundary here, but it's important. Uh, a single orbit on the boundary in this case. And that one contributes only the even, even repeats, even powers contribute to this. Let's say, uh, I'll write it for minus because then you can see some sign showing up. So the first guy looks just like what you always expect them to look. The weight of it. <coughs> the second guy 
shows up with the wrong sign for uh, dynamical zeta functions. There's a plus here. And the boundary guy looks very weird. It actually only gets contributions from the odd ones rather than. So this is the simplest example. And uh, I will next work it out for three disk system. So what I find very surprising and unexpected is every eigenvalue of the chain to gets contribution from all periodic orbits of original problem. It's relative periodic orbits. It's thing on everything is done on reduced space and just one slice of the pie. And uh, there are some interesting group theoretical weights. And you, you know, again, you might hate this, but it turns out when you factor a spectral determinant, every spectrum converges much faster than in the product, which I'll try to explain why. So I claim it's a triple home run. You'll get simpler symbolic dynamics. You'll need very few cycles compared to <coughs> what you would need if you didn't do symmetry factorization. And you'll get much better convergence in your computations. So uh, in retrospect, it's worth it if you have a problem that has a symmetry and you have to compute an average on it. And in quantum mechanics, they don't teach you anything else. So in quantum mechanics, you know, you don't see this formula, but this first formula, this is how you only taught quantum mechanics after you have used the group theory, because it would be total insanity not to use it. You could be stupid and you could, you know, just compute hydrogen atom in Cartesian coordinates and no symmetries at all. No M's, L's, etc. You, you know, computers run, you will get a few eigenvalues fairly well. But if you're smart, you do it analytically. And yeah, that, that's kind of the essential part. Nobody promised you a rose garden. Nobody promised you a rose garden. You know, when you decided to do physics, you knew it wouldn't be. Yeah. But it, well, it's not as hard as, you know, Computing 12,000 obviously won't need it.